Hello and welcome to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast. I'm Morag Gamble. In this episode, I'm delighted to be speaking with Stephanie Hafferty, based on a half acre farm in lovely Lampeter in Wales. Stephanie is an award winning gardener and food author. She wrote The Creative Kitchen and co authored No Dig Organic Home and Garden. And she's the cover girl of a recent permaculture magazine, too. She's also been featured in the long-running UK gardening show, BBC Gardener's World, and has 30 years of practical experience to share. She runs courses in her edible garden and soon online workshops, and is a simple living and no-dig gardening advocate, a sought-after speaker at gardening events, and she consults too with edible gardening projects far and wide. In this episode, Stephanie shares a wonderful story about how she discovered permaculture and gardening, the joy she derives from it and how growing food has helped her to put healthy food on her children's plates on a small income. This affordability and accessibility piece is a big part of what Stephanie is about and what she shares with people. Nothing highbrow or expensive, just straightforward, simple advice to get a diversity of healthy food from the pot to the plate and how to grow food all year round in places like Wales. The Sense Making in a Changing World podcast is an initiative of the Permaculture Education Institute. We teach permaculture design certificate, permaculture teacher certificate, and permaculture business skills online to people on six continents, who in turn localize and enrich it and find appropriate ways to apply the planet care ethics of earth care, people care, and fair share wherever they are. I'm recording this episode from my hand-built solar-powered studio here on beautiful Gubby Gubby country, surrounded by my permaculture-designed gardens. Before we jump in, I'd love to invite you to subscribe to Sense Making the Changing World on your favourite podcast app and leave us a five-star review and a lovely comment. It honestly really does help the bots to find this podcast. All right, let's go. I, I thoroughly enjoyed catching up with fellow No Dig Gardener across the seas, and I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did. And remember to check out the show notes below for all the links to Stephanie's work. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Steph. It's lovely to see you again. It's been a couple of years. Um, I think it was pre-pandemic when I caught up with you in Somerset. And now you're in lovely Lampeter. How's life in Lampeter? <laughs> Over in it, is, it is gorgeous here. Yeah. It is lovely. Yeah, it's um, where I live is very, very rural. So all the views are fields and more fields and fields again. And uh, it's absolutely fabulous. Mm. I love it in Wales. Yeah, I I am. Um... I visited Wales last time I was there and actually to Lampeter. And one of the lasting memories I have of our journey there was this gorgeous little people's market that had seed library and local food, local cheeses, all these wonderful things going on. And there seems to be quite a bit of a permaculture community that's scattered around that area. Is that is that still going since a few years ago? Yes, absolutely. When I moved here, of course, it was I moved during lockdown and Wales had a very strict lockdown. Um, and so none of these things were happening, but it's all reopened again and the little market's still going. And um, yeah, it's local produce, local cheeses. There's um, fish because we're not too far from the coast. There's um, local meats, local everything, really. It's it's lovely. And uh a lot of permaculture stuff going on. We've got the Welsh Permaculture Gathering is happening here in September um, on Patrick Holden's farm, which is about 20 minutes away. So, uh, yeah, it's the hub oh, of wonderful. permaculture possibly here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it felt beautiful when I was there last time. I hope I can get to visit again when I, when I come again later in the year. I think I'm going to miss you at the permaculture festival, the... British one, you'll be at the Welsh one, and I'm not. I'm yeah. Gonna... Anyway. <laughs> yeah, the British one. That's about a six-hour drive away from here, so I'm going for the one that's twenty minutes away. Yeah, that's that sounds that makes a whole lot of sense indeed. <laughs> so, so um, I'd love to hear a bit of your origin story of, of gardening. Like, where did you all love it? Because you're so immersed in in gardening, and you you know you you're an award-winning author, and you've been on BBC. 
um, you know, you've gardening seems to just be surrounded around you and immersed through you. Where did that begin for you? Like, where did your love of gardening come in? Uh, well, apparently, according to my mum, I've always liked grubbing in the mud, her term. <laughs> Um, and I remember as a child being really happy being in nature and being in the garden and I'd make little fairy gardens um, underneath shrubs and things. So I've always enjoyed that. Um, actually, gardening to produce edibles. Um, I had cacti and succulents on my windowsill as a, as a child and I enjoyed having those. Um, but I got into growing plants um outside when I got a book from a charity shop when I was about 17 and um it was an old-fashioned book on making wine from plants <laughs> and of course I'm 17 and I discovered you could make alcohol <laughs> from <laughs> things you grow so I start I got picked bought the book for you know 50p I've still got it it's falling apart now but still going strong and um, I had a corner of my parents garden where I grew a few plants and got some demijohns and things and started to learn how to make wine. <laughs> how did that go? Was it tasty or was it? Uh, a bit... Some of it you could strip paint with and yes, some of it was great. Right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it was variable, but um, yeah, some of them were lovely. Uh, I'm sure it's boosted my immune system somehow, <laughs> some of the brews that were concocted. Yeah. Yeah. But um, and then gradually I then went off to uni. And while I was there, I really got into um, making as much food as I could because obviously it's cheaper and um, then got interested in plants for cooking. <laughs> not just making alcohol from. I know a lot of uni students and I've been involved in helping to get a number of university gardens started. Not everyone does that, though, even though it is cheaper and it makes a whole lot of sense. It Like, what, you know, what was there that inspired you to do that? And where did you grow? Were you living at home or did you, were you in a... Oh, this was this was very small scale. This was window cells, so it's like pots of herbs and things. Oh. But I was lucky that where I, I was a student in Bristol... And I had, there were organic um, shops and things at a time when this wasn't very normal. Mm -hmm. So I was getting aware of all of this. The Soil Association was big there, although I had no, um, I wasn't like doing anything with them. I was aware of their presence. Mm -hmm. And I lived quite near a community garden in St. Werberg's, which is still there. And these a lot, we actually, to be perfectly honest, we were walking to the pub, but you'd walk past all these allotments to get to St. Werberg City Farm, where there was a really good pub. Mm -hmm. So I mean, <laughs> I was a student, I socialized, <laughs> I went to bed at six in the morning, you know, but um it was so it was there and just by walking around and seeing all these things you're gradually getting it oh this is interesting I could do this and once I left for my first job I was a t I uh, did a postgrad to be a teacher and I went and got a job in uh, Cambridgeshire I actually had access to outdoor space properly then and I started you know the usual things tomatoes and more herbs and just started getting into growing a few bits and pieces and it kind of went on. Yeah I think it's interesting how you're saying that just the fact that things are around you that it's there it goes in somehow and I think this is really important I, I was doing a talk the other day around um the, the way that we design our cities and suburbs and how the ones that have the food embedded in them, like village homes in Davis, California, or some of the Danish eco-villages where there's food everywhere and, you know, some of those traditional towns and villages where you have the allotments, that it just becomes part of our norm. But in a mm. lot of the tradition and like the newer suburbs that we have, say like in Australia now, there's just nothing edible. It's just cheek to jowl, houses and lawn, and that's it. And so as a child growing up in that or even as a teenager, it's just not going in in that sense that you have these possibilities. So I love that, that it's it just kind of went in in some way or other. But um, what led you to actually get to the point of becoming, 
you mean uh, what you call now like a homesteader and growing lots of your own food for your family and you know and how and does it does it actually save you a lot of money like that's a question I guess that people want to know because at the moment with all the crises that are happening like is growing all that food actually helping you significantly that's a very good question I was was giving a talk at the London Permaculture Festival a week ago and that question was raised as well um so I I was a very bookish child. I read and read and read and read. I would go to a party and sit in a corner and read. So I was, I was a great excitement to be around. Um, but I loved to read things like Little House on the Prairie, those kinds of books, which I know have issues now. Obviously, I didn't when I was a small child. And I would play kind of farming and homesteading with my Lego and my Playmobil. <laughs> so I got a piece of hardboard and made my garden and using paint in and crayons and so as a little child I was playing going off and gathering and farming (laughs) it sounds completely mad now but this was how I liked to play um and making all this stuff and you know out of lego and um then as I got older it was this interest which again I think was why I was attracted to making wine it's the idea of being able to make something and then discovering that you can actually make jam it doesn't have to come from the shelves Mm -hmm. and um watching the good life I mean that brainwashed a lot of people in (laughs) in Britain oh my gosh yes the good life that was yes. influential for me. That, like, I didn't get to watch much telly as a kid. My my parents were pretty strict on that, but they did let me sit and watch The Good Life with them. Yeah, t- yeah. So, um, and I inflicted this on my children as well. <laughs> so, so they've had that experience. So, um, it was all these various factors. So, some of it's reading. Some of it was from television, and then. Um, Once I was getting into growing food, I started to read. My mum gave me Jeff Hamilton's organic gardening book. And then I, when I became a parent, I was 27 when I had my daughter. Um, One of the things we did living in Wiltshire and then Somerset was go to a lot of green festivals and fairs. And that's how I got to find out about permaculture. And I got the... Um, what is that? I've completely gone blank on that. <laughs> the s- small holding book everybody had. Seymour, John Seymour's oh, book. John Seymour's, yeah. So I, I got a copy of that from the library. Um, very big on libraries. Libraries, we had one in the b- bottom of our road. And brilliant, the amount of books you can get out, sort of devoured all these permaculture and gardening books and all of that kind of thing. Um it really intrigues me being able to make stuff. I love it. I think it goes back to when you're very small and you're making things from glue and cardboard and sticky paper. It's the same kind of pleasure of creativity, but you can eat it or you can drink it or you can. Yeah. And from the so I got into growing more and more and more food when I had my daughter. Obviously, I just had her and I was renting a place in um, Northamptonshire and we had I I was sort of digging out because I didn't know about no dig then and I was digging out bits of the garden and growing what I could because you know I'm there on my own with a small child and I was skint and it all helps and I was interested in doing it and then had more children and for a time um, I was with I was married and we bought um, a small house in Wiltshire which was an ex-council house and because it was affordable back in those days, you could get an ex council house on a mortgage with one salary, mm. you know, and now just not possible. An ex rural British rural old ex old council houses were made with big gardens, relatively big gardens. The idea was you had enough space to have fruit trees, keep chickens, grow vegetables and keep a pig by the standards of those days. So we're talking houses put up in the 20s and 30s. And um, so as I had chickens and ducks um, and I started my veg garden there. And after a couple of years, we had three kids. So we moved to a slightly bigger house in Somerset. And the same thing, gradually getting more and more and more food growing as was possible around having young children. Um, 
and we were pretty skimp, particularly when my husband and I broke up. I'm there on my own with three kids and a very low income and absolutely for sure growing as much food as I could and preserving and storing it as I could made a big difference. I also stalked the discount parts of the supermarkets and all of that kind of thing too. So yeah, I think it ca- if you've got the space to get as much food as you can, and it is about accessibility mm-hmm. to land. And I was lucky to be able to get something we're going way back you know my as I say my daughter's nearly 29 um when it was affordable to be able to get these places or relatively affordable on a mortgage so um, in um in the UK now where are the most um accessible places to access land then is it uh people still able to get allotments enough allotments big enough sizes to grow food how's that What's the situation there? I hear there's long lines for allotments or is it? Is it, yeah. mm-hmm. it Again, it depends where you are. So in, in some places, there's long, long waiting lists. Um, the allotment I had in Somerset, so I grew in my garden and the allotment up the road. Uh, my allotment cost me £20 a year. Mm-hmm. You know, that was, and you could get five tonnes of well-rotted cow manure from the local farm for 30 quid. Wow. Um, so and that did actually two years. So it was that was you could easily grow that amount of food mm. um, and more. So that was definitely accessible and affordable, um, even on a low income as I was then. I still am actually. But um, then in other places, because it became very um, fashionable, for want of a better word, it became very popular to have allotments to grow your own food, uh, particularly during all the lockdowns, prices have increased, increased, increased. Some places are very expensive. Some organisations are buying up land and converting them to allotments. And I mean, literally, they're charging a fortune. It's all about making money, um, which it seems. And then you're only making accessible it accessible to people on high incomes who um, you know, fair oh, enough. Right. Absolutely, everyone should be able to grow, but it's not accessible to people who really need um, to have that. And there are the um, edible Bristol, like my friend Sarah runs edible Bristol. So there are community projects in a lot of cities using land there to create community spaces so it really does depend and there's also areas which are essentially food deserts and there's there's nothing Mm. and that pretty much entirely all of those places are where actually there is the most need yeah so um some bits are good some bits are terrible yeah yeah so the kind of methods that you use for um, that you teach, you you run courses, and you you you're a writer, and you blogger, and you have YouTube, and you offer people tours into your place. What are the kind of methods that you're teaching people to help them to get started in their gardens? Like, what's what are your what are your go to methods that you help people with? Um, so I mostly teach um, the no dig gardening method. Um, but I teach it in a um, different ways of doing it that are affordable because a lot of people think of no dig gardening as like when I used to work on no dig market gardens. Um, a lot of those beds were made six inches, 15 centimetres of compost on the ground, which is fair play if you can get access to it. But most people can't afford that. So I teach different ways of doing it, which are using less compost and um is much cheaper um but and, and another thing it's growing how to grow food year round with the planning yeah. and i'm lucky i've got a polytunnel that's great but i also say if you don't have a polytunnel this is what you can do this is what you can make using essentially free resources and and waste yeah. so and also teaching what you can do with it yeah yeah because that's i think a lot of people um because um, there has been a bit of a separation between food production and cooking. Um, 
a lot of people, they're growing, they get their allotment and they grow all this stuff. And then it's like, OK, I've got three recipes for courgettes in my repertoire. What do I do with these 40 courgettes I now have? <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so. And also we are, you know, we are in a bit of a changing climate at the moment. So it's looking at ways of growing without soil disturbance and how things may be adapted because as you'll know from having been to the UK we are the land of the slug it's um we have I think the world's largest slug population or it certainly feels like it so a lot of the methods we use here are very much about reducing habitat for slugs but um we are also starting to get long dry periods yeah. which for a country which is used to the summer basically being like it is today i mean wet is um it's a challenge and it's a change yeah yeah i think i think i started to hear about that last time because i you know many many years ago when i was there people were saying oh we don't have to worry about all the things you do in australia because mm. it's just going to rain and our rain barrels are like this big because we'll just get them filled up tomorrow whereas you know here we have 25,000 litres stored on our property because, you know, there's such a dearth of, of water at certain times of year. But this this changing climate, as you're talking about, um, is making us really think about how we can build resilience into our gardens exactly. so much more. And, uh, you know, some things that I like to look at in my garden is that there be this framework of those really robust and resilient plants that then we can intersperse with other seasonal things. And I, I wonder in your climate, what are some of those just, you know, those foundational plants that you always include as like sort of survival food plants that keep you going throughout the year? What are they in your part of the world? Um, I think we don't have the same range as you might do in Australia because of our climate and our relatively short growing season. Um, but certainly perennial brassicas would be a key thing um, because they pretty much crop year round and um, you can always make a meal out of some perennial kale leaves with other ingredients. Um, it's it depends very much where you are, I think, as well in the UK. Um, and I, I did note if you have too much planting, then you're creating a slug habitat. Too much. So I have perennial areas where I wouldn't grow lettuce, for example, because they just get slugged because the slugs are living under some of my perennial plantings. Uh, this may change, you know, the slugs may all bog off. They might decide it's too dry here. But um, I and mostly things like the plants that are there permanently are things like fruit. Um, so fruit trees, soft fruit, that kind of thing, which I do grow around. I grow in my orchard here, which the, the, the um, apples were already here when I moved. Um, I grow all food underneath. And I did this in my previous garden because I'm trying to grow as much as I can. And it's surprising how much you can grow under the shade of trees. One big difference I noticed uh, when I put my polytunnel up here, I put it in the only space that it would fit. So there wasn't any design to it at all. It was literally this is the only bit of my garden where a polytunnel that size can go. And I was a bit concerned about its proximity to all these fruit trees. And actually, it's thinking it's going to be shady. I'm not going to get any tomatoes. It's turned out to be a bonus because when we get these for Britain hot, dry spells. So it's all relative for other parts of the world. It's like a balmy summer's day. But for us, it's like crikey. It was shading. So as the sun was moving, when it got to the hottest part of the day, these trees are shading the polytunnel. Yeah. And so problems that some other people have had, like my friends in Somerset, with things just literally stopping growing because they're almost cooking. I'm not getting that because of these plantings. So I think looking at how you can use larger plants, trees and things within gardens as things. I mean, we don't know how things are changing. We literally haven't a clue. Mm -hmm. So but it's certainly. Um, it's looking beyond that idea of having an allotment and it being a 
or a vegetable garden and it being a rectangle of mm. fairly low planting with and you were always taught you know don't put have it near trees because they'll suck all the moisture out so that's a that's a shift isn't it there's like there's things yeah. that are changing and there's there's approaches that that uh, really making us think differently about what 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 we imagine is the right way to garden in our places and i'm i'm seeing the shifts and changes here too so when you got your garden started there because i know you only moved to this new place in a couple of years ago now is it yeah. about yeah it was um, march 21 yeah yeah so that's gosh that's almost two years well it's over two years now it's over two years yeah, yeah. so what did you do when you arrived there so you you've left a garden that you've been working on for 20 years and you landed in a new place did you decide to do things differently what was or you know then what was your first starting point how do you design it and get it going to amplify the the growth there as a as a as a starting point um so i obviously i would had been planning it since i knew that we were going to move and i had um which wasn't too long it was um i think gosh i'm trying to think how long it took maybe three four months from the offer being accepted to actually physically getting it um so one of the things I did was I, as part of my moving house budget, a moving house is so expensive. Mm. And when someone says moving house budget, what they're really meaning is what else is going on the mortgage to pay for this? So it's not like pots of gold sitting around the house that you've got available. Um, I did include getting compost because I knew I needed to get my garden set up really quickly. It was locked down. I didn't have any of the accessibility to networks that you would normally have, such as finding out where you can get municipal waste compost or farm manure or whatever. I I, be, I had an arrangement with a, a certified organic compost company that I already knew, and we sorted that out. So I got the keys on the Wednesday we moved in on the Friday and the compost came on the Monday so I was that <laughs> organized and I had my the road road is right there, isn't it? yeah so I'm moving a home of you know three well there's three kids and me so there was one there was a removal van with all our stuff in and then like a half removal van that they attached to the back that I put all my garden in so I'd been growing a lot of things in pots anyway um at home, my previous home because I had areas of concrete and I was making growing forest gardens on concrete to increase um, food production so all of that went in all of my stuff all of my hoops and netting and um <laughs> I've been splitting plants so I'm bringing things with me Right. as well um so with soft fruit and that kind of stuff the people I bought from weren't gardeners they hadn't lived here very long but the lady before she was keen mm -hmm. and so things like uh, the established fruit trees that are here some of the fruit bushes I had some edibles here already mm -hmm. um but mostly it was a it was grass and yeah. some flower borders which are lovely I haven't had to do anything with the flower borders so I and also I, I knew I was going to be away for nearly a month because I was project managing a show garden at Hampton Court in sort of from the middle of June. So not very long, just a few weeks later. So I decided to do the cardboard compost no dig method that I'd been using for some years in what we could in the back garden so there's an area of grass just outside the back door and on um, March the 31st we'd unpacked some boxes put cardboard down on the weedy grass and I put five centimeters two inches of compost on top cardboard for paths and I just as I had the time I made a bed mm -hmm. and planted it up because I literally just moved you know I had to get some plants and sow some seeds um, in the orchard I'm again gradually, literally a bit at a time, making beds there. And that one, some of it was compost. And I've, I'm using resources that were here. I had to get some trees chopped down um, because they were hazardous. They were dangerous. So I had a lot of wood chip and sawdust. Um, so although it wasn't a free resource because I'd had to pay to get the trees cut, um, it was a resource. So I'm using 
different kinds of mulches and experimenting. And so all of the orchard beds pretty much have been using stuff that's around here. Um, the odd one used compost if I needed to. And I've then set up compost heaps. So it's been a mixture of a way I knew really did work mm. and experiments. Fun. Sounds like fun. And I know yeah, that it was. It you're um, talking about bringing groups into your garden. So when you were designing this, I, I often um, explore this with, with students of ours who are, who are doing the permaculture design course and the permaculture teachers course and talking about, well, how do you design a garden that's going to be an educational garden? Well, as you were thinking about designing it, were you thinking about how it could be part of that as well as being for you? Like what elements become, are you thinking are the educational elements or this different kind of maybe different kind of spaces or areas that people could meet outside? Or how did you think that through? Was that is that part of it or they're just going to weave their way through your <laughs> <laughs> well, I've only got about half an acre here, and that includes the footprint of the house and the where I park my car and that kind of thing. Mm. So it's not a huge space. Um, certain things like in the polytunnel, which is 45 feet long, the first 10 feet are wood chipped with like a little border. So that that was partly so that I've got um a space to make things when it's raining, and partly um so that I had an area under cover that I could have people in. Right. My The groups that visit here, the courses are very small, yeah. eight, ten people at the most, yeah. um, which is practical when you're running something on your own. Yeah. And also, um, so I wasn't thinking very large groups for this space. Um, previous courses I co-ran were looking at 18 to 20 people. So, and that was on a much bigger plot yeah. but yeah so I had it was quite interesting how making the garden accessible for my family and a family space because my previous garden I um I completely filled it for the vegetables by the time my children were teens so we had nowhere to sit outside you had to like <laughs> perch on things so then said the top bit of the orchard it was like this is going to be kept for family for barbecues put tents up my kids can have friends come and camp um so that has naturally created a space where I can also host courses and talk to people and then we can move around but the courses are very much walking around the garden and um, yeah, right. interacting with what's here but the planting was first and foremost practical stuff for growing food my ambition is to get 75 80 percent self-sufficient in plant food yeah. so not coffee and I don't want a closed loop I want to be able to go to the market yeah. and <laughs> I think that's food. really important isn't it you know often with the with homesteading it's the thinking that you know we have to be self-sufficient and it's not is it it's about being you know being growing as much as you can and then having a relationship with your community and and trading and exchanging and and that's that's really important because otherwise it can feel like a big slob and you can feel quite alone as well and I you know this yeah is... mm. yeah I think I think one thing as well this whole COVID pandemic thing with people being like stuck at home and has shown us is the value of community yeah. and how much most of us really do enjoy interacting with other people and also you know if I made all my bread then I wouldn't be getting the pleasure of going and buying the locally made bread in Lampeter and you don't get those interactions. And if we all make our own bread, they're going to go out of business. So it's working out the balance between, yeah, you know, I want to make all my jams and chutneys and I've got a canner, so I bottle mm. tomatoes, that kind of thing. But I also want to be able to go and buy my organic lemons from the organic farm shop because yeah. try growing lemons in Wales. It's hilarious. And the winter killed my plants. So... <laughs> I'm not going to do yeah. that anymore. And it's, it's just being realistic, isn't it? But I love, I love what you're saying about this. You know, the the preserving and the jams and 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 thinking through. Well, what can I do, and what can I, you know, be supporting my community doing? So you have a book um, out that talks a lot about processing food and and cooking food. Um, I want to ask you about books because. Um, Part of one of the series that I run on on this podcast is is it's a permaculture writer series, and you have you've 
you've got your book called um, The Creative Kitchen and you co-wrote a book called The No Dig Organic Home and Garden. And yeah. your process of writing, I'd love to hear about, like, you have three kids, you're running this program, you're working to earn a living. How do you get to write a book at the same time? <laughs> you have the time to do that. I am, I'm so in awe of anyone who writes a book, obviously, you know, like it just, it's, it's an enormous task. How do you how do you do it? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, the hilarious thing about writing the creative kitchen was because you're having to recipe test, and some of it was in the winter, so I'm having to get you know the aubergines and the courgettes from an online supermarket <laughs> in order to recipe test. <laughs> But um, I'm just getting like, we're all eating like nothing but soups and salads for a whole week when I was taking those photos. Um, yeah, it is. Um, I am. So one of my main jobs is as a writer. I'm a feature writer for magazines. And so I do schedule it in as it is part of my day's work. Um, but so um, it is finding the time on just working long days. I, I tend to do a seven day week often and that isn't viable, really. Yeah. Um, but I think, I mean, as I moved here, starting again, I had to, I unexpectedly lost my main job mm. um, within a couple of weeks of moving here, which was a hell of a shock. And um, so I think I, I just worked and worked and worked as you do yeah. and I definitely need a little bit more of a work-life balance yeah but yeah. it's it's setting all these things up you just keep at it yeah um, I did go and visit my dad for a month in January and uh, relaxed oh. I read books not written by me but it's scheduling it's finding the time yeah. um and as I say it isn't easy when you're doing lots of other jobs too but yeah, you, you know, and the, but the fact that you're best, you, really. you are a writer, you know, obviously that's you have a discipline of doing it and a, and a particular way of structuring it. Do you do you actually map out the whole book to begin with? Like, what's the actual structure of how you go and do it? Like, do you see the book? Yeah, and then you write it out. Is that how it works? Um, <laughs> yeah, it was getting um so you get an idea of what the chapters are going to be and what the topics are I mean one was co-written so we just split who was writing what more or less mm. um some things were both some things were one or the other um obviously and yeah plans I have pads I've got one on my desk here um I actually weirdly handwrite quite a lot of it mm. but I find um handwriting uses a different part of the brain to my typing brain so even when I'm writing an article, I map it out on paper first with a pen. Yeah. And um, it's actually this pen here. And <laughs> I was given this when I went to university at 19 by my friend. And I've still got it. Oh, <laughs> so nice. this, this has been very helpful just by refills every now and then. Yeah. And um, and then I type it up. Yeah. So it's it's a lot of uh, planning first. Are you, um, I'm having a clear idea of what... Um, you're going to be talking about in each chapter and each like subsection of chapters yeah. very different with a recipe book to a gardening book obviously for practical reasons <laughs> so <laughs> creative home you you've got recipes but you've also got recipes for your for your body as well what other sorts of things can people find in that book of yours um, so there's some sort of interesting preserve shortcuts sort of making bouillons and and things that you can store in a, a, a simple storage. You can just store it in a clean jam jar on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And then in the winter time, get those flavours and fragrances of the summer and add it to your food. And um, there's, there's alcohol, unsurprisingly, <laughs> given how it all started. Um, I've, and um, one of the things with and there's some crafts too. Mm. And one of the things with making things for your skin or how to clean your things you can use to clean your house is partly allergies. Mm. So I'm like, if I go down the detergent aisle of a supermarket, I'll get a headache. I'll start sneezing. Yeah. And I'm with you there. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a lot to do with finding ways of cleaning the loo, which isn't going to give me a blinding headache. Mm. Um, and also, I like to think if particularly, I started off growing 
on a windowsill and then in a very small garden. So each plant really needs to work on many as many levels as possible. So it's thinking if you've grow parsley on your windowsill to flavor your meals, these are the other things you can do with parsley. Yeah, you know, so it's going beyond just seeing it as something that's chopped up and added to your soup. Yeah, yeah. It's not just a garnish. <laughs> <laughs> the bit that gets left off on the side of the plate when you go out and you sort of see the edges of plates, there's always the little bits of parsley or the topping. I know, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's the best bit. Why do you need that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, look. I th- I think it's I think it's wonderful, and I I want I wondered like from you were talking about that joy of gardening like early on as a child, and just that that was something that was there with you. I, I I've been wondering about this lately. There's something that I feel there needs to be a word that describes this, and I'm trying to look for a word. Maybe you know I'm I'm going to ask you because there's something about when you walk outside your door and you're surrounded by food and you can just go and harvest your lunch or you grab some fruit or you can get something to clean there's this deep sense of feeling contented of Mm. feeling secure of smelling it and feeling like that joy or hearing the sound of the birds or watching something going on there's this contentment but there's a it's not biophilia it's not there's a word about being surrounded by an edible landscape and I haven't come across it yet and I'm looking you for it. I haven't. I no, don't know. I'm it. gonna make one up. I am going to make one up because there is I no would, definitely. Here. But there yes. is, there's something and I know there's people who get incredible contentment from being surrounded by beautiful ornamental gardens mm-hmm. and absolute fact, you know, we're all different. I have good friends and that's the what they do and they create these amazing spaces that just make people go oh whereas I like to be surrounded by things you can eat or make things from and that really relaxes me makes me happy (laughs) and I even am happy here so where I live the lake well you've been to Welsh you know how the lanes are here you can barely get a car down them (laughs) so from my my front garden here is quite tiny and then there's the lane and then the hedge of the field opposite and from sitting here, basically, it's just food. This yeah. hedge, it's either food for me or yeah. food for the wild things. Yeah. And it's wonderful. It's just nonstop looking everywhere you look. It's like, and I appreciate, I'm very lucky I live in a rural area. Yeah. It's um, funny because people... um, my, my daughter, I was telling you before we jumped online, my daughter's just gone to live on campus at a university in Canberra. And she's grown up here in this eco village, surrounded by permaculture gardens. And and one of the first things she said to me when she got there, she said, "Mum, I just feel really disconnected from my food system." Anyway, we <laughs> we would wander through the campus and we'd go, "Oh, look, here's some lavender, or here's some lily pills, like native berries." And anyway, and we had this great time just reconnecting with that there was a food system on campus if you just happened to look in the right places. You know, there was some ginkgo and all things, you know, really interesting and unusual things. And and then she said she went walking through the landscape with with her friends that she'd met at uni and started saying, oh, there's this and this. Then how do you know this stuff? Like who who are you, plant lady? (laughs) Like that she can read the edible landscape. I think there's 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 a skill and it's a lost art, I think, in many ways, that this ability to notice the edibleness of plants. And there's some some really beautiful quality to be able to share that. So, you know, the fact that you're taking people on wanders through your gardens and inviting them into that space to, to get to know all the multiple ways you can use parsley and all the ways you can store and share and bring a bit of summer into your winter. And that's important. Is it it touches us some way. That's kind of almost an unspeakable quality of that of joy that that brings into our life, and it makes us feel secure and happy and and nourished. Yeah, yeah, it is wonderful. I think also as well. I mean, for people who haven't got access to their own growing spaces, um, when I was writing Creative Kitchen, I made sure that if there was a recipe that involved chopped tomatoes, um, which were going to be cooked. I made sure that the recipe worked around the same quantity that you would get from a tin of tomatoes to make it accessible to people whose only access to food is the local 
supermarket Mm -hmm. and you can get incredible pleasure from getting lots of peaches from the bargain bin at the supermarket and making your own preserve I'm saying peaches because they're quite difficult to grow here (laughs) I've got I've got three peach trees and they're they're about three feet high I've only just put them in Um, so I think there's ways of connecting with creating food Mm. even if you can't yet have access to edible spaces where you live I'm a huge fan of bargain bins at the supermarket, you might have noticed. <laughs> well, yeah. I, and I think too, like what you're saying, you know, a way to find how you can reconnect with, with your food rather than it just being an assembly task, but actually the, mm. the art of cooking, the art of growing, that, you know, that it it is something, there's a very visceral joy that comes from that level of connectivity and and I think there's also stories to share we do it together like when we come back to the community like community meals if you had I don't know if Lampeter has community meals where people bring potluck dinners you know someone brings different things to share I always love those because you get to say oh wow you did that with that wow that's incredible (laughs) yeah the first night of the uh, permaculture festival is a potluck so when you come you bring your dish of whatever and so um, that will be, yeah, there are potluck type of things around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a food festival here at the end of the month um, at the university. Oh, so okay. I'm there giving a talk of plot to plate. So I'm going to talk about some of the things you can grow and what to do with them. So there is definitely more and more going on with connecting. I think one problem can be sometimes that, and I'm I'm also with my, I'm also a member of the Guild of Food Writers, so I, which is brilliant for like the amount of international cuisine and the stories and the heritage stories that people oh, yeah. talk about. God, it's fascinating. You just want to literally travel the world and eat. That's <laughs> that's what you know. Just like do nothing but eat in all these all these different cuisines. Um, is there can be a disconnection between. Um, seasonal food and affordability um well, i don't know how it is in australia but certainly here um we've got problems with a lot of the slow food movement and that kind of thing it's actually only accessible if you're at a certain income level yeah, yeah. so it's making it as it always was you know my background is um working class in the north of england And my great granddad supplemented the family income with an allotment. And this is in Bradford, which Mm. is a massive industrial town. Mm. Um, So it was something that regular folk did, not just middle class and beyond. And I think it's rekindling that is really important, which is why these urban um, community gardens are brilliant, are so important. Yeah. Because the amount of times I see, you know, seasonal local food recipes and it cost a blinking fortune to get all the other ingredients. Yeah. Which is my fine seasonal. if you want to make that, but it's <laughs> not really what most of us can do. No, I look at my garden and go, what's growing? All right, that's what I'm eating today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Other- that's pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I do have frozen peas in the freezer. For those emergencies in the like, in the winter, when you realise, oh, it's time to make dinner, it's now dark and it's <laughs> hailing, yes, the emergency right, yeah. bag of frozen peas from the supermarket will come yeah. out now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, generally it's like, okay, what's what are we harvesting now? What's there? Yeah. What's um, there? Yeah. Exactly. Um, the one yeah. thing we're not harvesting is onions because they all got eaten by mice when they were transplants. Oh, oh, so they come from the shops. <laughs> Everything. I've got a, I've, my my little um, friends in the garden at the moment. I've got bandicoots. Every time I plant something in, they're they're, they're like mice, but they're about this big. And they've got very oh. big noses, and they like to when when you do extra compost on things, they like to go down and eat things in the soil, and they flick out all your little transplants as they're going along. So come out every morning, and everything <laughs> flicked out. Oh, that's really frustrating. And the other one is. I have some scrub turkeys that are actually going in and trying to scratch out lots of tubers at the moment. So I'm just thinking, okay, well, they're just kind of cleaning up that section for me and um, I'll come 
follow them after they've moved on. I'm I'm, I'm not going to fight them. I've I've decided that my approach to gardening is a peaceful way of gardening. <laughs> Otherwise, it can do your head in, really, can't it? Oh, totally. I'm happy. I have a trail camera in the garden, so I know there's five at least farm cats that come here every evening. So I'm surrounded by farms. So these are cats that they just live in barns. So they come along. They they think my garden's theirs. So I know, I mean, we've got rats and moles and voles and mice, obviously all rodenty things about. So they're helping keep the balance because it's all about balance. I know there's rats living in one of my compost heaps and I'm just thinking, well, while you're eating what I'm putting in there, you're not eating the stuff over there. So this is, <laughs> you stay there, you're turning the heat for me and your food for, I've got owls here. Um, there's lots of birds of prey. So I am all, I mean, it's partly, I mean, I've got this beautiful shed that I can't use at the moment um, because there's a wasp's nest in it. Oh. And so I'm, which makes me sound all lovely and benign, because obviously I am not going to kill a wasp's nest because we need wasps. But I am also, and also aware of their role as predators. Mm. So they're eating my cabbage white caterpillars. They're eating my aphids. So it sounds really nice and friendly and let's be at peace with everything. But I am also thinking of the whole hierarchy of predators and the balance between predators and prey. Yeah, that's right. Um, you need to. Yeah. Which is which is nature. So I don't know what eats bandicoots, but I imagine something does. Yeah, maybe, maybe owls. I, I just heard some owls outside before, but I think they're going for. I think the bandicoots got too big and fat on all my food. At the <laughs> <laughs> I have to send my kids out and dance around at night. I don't know. <laughs> You've got like these really sleek bandicoots yeah. that are just living their best lives. <laughs> oh gosh, it's been lovely chatting with you. Where can people find out more about your? all the things that you've got going on. Um, we, we'll make sure that we pop the link down in the chat too, but just speak it out now in case anyone hasn't got a pen and paper or doesn't see that note. Yeah. Okay. Well, conveniently, almost everything, my social media, website, everything is my name, Stephanie Hafferty. Um, so that's easy to find. Um, I have my YouTube channel as well. It's like Stephanie Hafferty Homesteading. I think it's that. Um but it's definitely Stephanie Hafferty. Um, my website's also No Dig Home, but both go to the same place. Right. Um, books are available all over the place. And I will be doing, so I do courses here, but I'm in the process of writing things which will be available online. Fantastic. So more accessible to international people. Although I do have people coming from America to one of my courses here. Oh, so fantastic. Are, they are then going on holiday in Wales, oh, um, wow, which is wow. exciting. I mean, Wales historically is, I mean, the landscape is to die for. It's um, it is stunning. And the history here is amazing. So it is, um, I can see why someone would come all the way from the States just to immerse themselves mm. in all things Welsh. Yeah, well, it's a beautiful place that you've landed and I really appreciate you taking the time to um, oh. share about your love of gardening and, and no dig and your approach to homesteading and all the resources. And I, yeah, I encourage anyone who's listening to this to check out the links that, that Stephanie shared and that you can find in the show notes below. And, um, yeah, stay in touch with, with Stephanie and, and thanks for listening and being part of our show today. Take care, everyone. Thank thanks, Steph. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Sense Making in a Changing World with edible gardening author and educator, the award-winning Stephanie Hafferty. Check out the show notes below to find the links to all her resources and also check out the notes for where you can find details of our permaculture design, gardening, teaching and business courses, our YouTube, our blog, our free masterclasses and film clubs, and come and join us at the Permaculture Education Institute to learn practical skills for designing, teaching permaculture, making a good livelihood while living a permaculture-inspired, one-planet way of life. Take care. I'll see you next time.